Okay. Hi, Hi. Sarah. Hi. Yeah. Excellent. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So Sarah Brown has been on the Sigmund faculty for several years now. Uh, uh, Sarah is uh, uh, Dr. S Dr. Brown uh, is uh, which uh, and can I say Sarah? I just never get tired of saying that. Um, oh, me either. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dr. Brown lives over in Wales, uh, and uh, I, I, I first got to meet Dr. Brown when I was over speaking in Wales. Um, uh, gosh, when was that? Was that 2010? I was, see, it was forever That's ago. Right. Yeah, that was that was a long time ago. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was Loughborough was 2012. That's right. That's right. Um, no, but I met you in 2010, I think, at the the thing that was in at Aberystwyth. Yes, uh, at Pontoed Van de if you want to be really technical about it. Right. Yeah. The name that I never did successfully I pronounce even pronounce. once. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I, I, I basically, I, I'm sort of, I, I, I settle for Aberyst with, you know, I can, I can pronounce that one. So I, that, I, that makes me, I feel a sufficient accomplishment there. I'll, uh, I'll let you off on that. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. So, so Dr. Brown is going to join us today to do, uh, uh, to give us a talk on Tolkien and alchemy, which I'm uh, very interested to hear. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to put this talk into a little bit of context because a, something like Tolkien and alchemy in the same breath is the response tends to be, huh, um, which is fair enough, actually. But uh, in my PhD thesis, what I was exploring was the way in which Tolkien was writing in response to all of the anxieties of the mid 20th century in Britain. Uh, a Britain that had come through two major world wars, that was seeing social upheaval, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that what he was doing was reaching back, looking back to um, older traditions of writing within his Middle Earth legendarium, but also looking forward um, towards a future that was worrying for many people, a future that saw uh, a different society in Britain, um, changing place of women in society, um, a new technologies that were coming through, uh, and that, as we know, Tolkien wasn't very keen on new technologies. So here we have him as a man situated here in the centre of this point, in the middle of the 20th century in Britain, which is reeling from this time and. The alchemy thing that I'm talking about sort of is that bit about reaching back towards the old traditions of writing. What I'm not claiming at all is that Tolkien set out to write a text that had alchemical themes in it. Not what I'm necessarily doing. What I am saying is that they can be seen within this text. And um, I do refer a lot to Carl Jung's writing. Um, Carl Jung wrote extensively on alchemy, and I do know that Tolkien read Carl Jung and knew of his works because when I was lucky enough to go and work in the Bodleian Library when I was working for my PhD thesis, I found multiple notes that Tolkien made on the works of Carl Jung. So um, for me, I can see where some of these alchemical resonances are coming from. So what I'm going to do for the next 20 minutes or so, it's only a pretty short um, talk, is give you a flavour of how alchemy can be seen within primarily the Lord of the Rings, um, because I'm keeping it to a, a relatively short talk today. So here we go. OK. All right. So first of all, there are two primary misconceptions about alchemy. Firstly, that it's bad science practiced by charlatans. Uh, secondly, that it's all about cauldron, sorcery, mysticism and magic. Um, a common image of alchemists is that of men in ancient times, clad in hoods and cloaks, muttering over steaming cauldrons, attempting to conjure pure gold from a lump of lead. Well, either that or it's Lord Percy from Blackadder, whose attempts to replicate this process led him to discover, to his personal delight, a substance he names purest green. Um, an alternative perception of alchemy comes by the theories of Carl Jung. Uh, he was keen to explore the meaning of the archetypes of alchemical texts and imagery in the collective consciousness of humanity and the dreams of individuals. 
and Jung conducted research into the continuing history of alchemy over a period of several decades. Alchemical discourse was central to the formulation of his theory of individuation, which is one of his most famous theories. So to this end, he mined alchemical texts, discerning in them a rich set of symbols for this process of transformative self-making. Despite a clearer appreciation of alchemy than many who came either before or after him, however, Jung concludes that alchemists were Gnostics, a view castigated by Titus Burkhardt as an unmistakable case of what he calls the historical projection of one's own empiricist and anti-religious beliefs into the past. So in other words, Jung seems to have fallen prey to a common misconception of alchemy as being heretical in nature, when actually the reverse is true, as there was a really strong connection between alchemy and spirituality. So it's easy to think of ourselves primarily as physical beings, perhaps according to individual beliefs in view of the soul. For the alchemist, true humanity was a seamless joining of soul and body, with the tragedy being the fall that had caused the loss of spiritual capacity or intellectus. Alchemy, therefore, was the means, in conjunction with religious belief, of regaining this lost capacity. The alchemical process was not merely about turning actual lead into gold. The substance truly undergoing this change was the alchemist's soul, and the real gold to be gained was spiritual riches. Now, key to this transformation was an understanding of the ways in which the workings of nature itself play their part. According to John Granger, the alchemist viewed nature as, he quotes, a rotation of the four elements, earth, air, fire, water, and of the polar qualities, hot and cold, dry and moist. And they work to simulate and accelerate this natural reaction in the alembic. Now, the substance within the alembic, which was the cauldron that was traditionally used by these alchemists was repeatedly purified through a process called solvate coagula or dissolve and congeal or expand contract again two polar opposites now this process was believed to enable both metal and alchemists to be transformed in sympathy as essential polarity is transcended and subject and object join as in a mirror the result of this purification process was twofold First, it was believed to yield the Philosopher's Stone, which alchemists believed could itself transform lead to gold, and whose elixir confers immortality upon the user. Second, and most important in terms of a literary understanding of alchemy, the process creates a new person who, as a result of the transformation caused by the conjunction of opposites and the resolution of contraries, is an incarnation of peace and love, a spiritually enlightened soul. Now, a concept of purification by identification or interaction with an object is analogous to the essential purpose of literature. A successful literary work may be measured by the edification of its audience. So in other words, dramatic release for the reader's soul may be achieved through the purifying experience of reading. Many readers of Tolkien's works, and I am going to get to Tolkien, will testify that reading The Lord of the Rings can be a life-changing experience. It certainly was for me. Um, it's so, something that can be returned to many times in the course of a lifetime, and each new reading can offer something fresh to the reader. Alchemy and literature both endeavour in some fashion to transform the human being. Alchemy through the purifying process of the production of the Philosopher's Stone and literature through a connection between author and reader, which draws the reader into the narrative and effects emotional change in the process. Now, alchemy is at the heart of a lot of great English literature, which is often rich in alchemical language, references, themes, and symbols. The works of Shakespeare, Chaucer, Blake, Dunn, Milton, and C.S. Lewis, as well as Tolkien himself, are laden with alchemical language and have alchemical themes at their core. The literary alchemy within The Lord of the Rings is a depiction of the process by which lives, beliefs, and cultures, as well as individual characters like Frodo, are altered, and each time we read and identify with his experiences, we undergo our own transformations through the alchemy of literature. In Frodo, we can see an alchemical exploration and resolution of the traditional diametrically opposed concepts of fate and free will. Frodo has a destiny in his quest to destroy the ring, but he will only fulfill this destiny through the ability to make right choices. This echoes the dual Christian alchemical message that we are created as images of God, but to become pure, we must die to the old fallen humanity within us and choose rightly 
the means to our perfection. So thus Frodo must die to himself as he journeys across the plains of Gorgoroth and in the Samath now in the presence of an all-seeing eye, which rather ironically in this case is also an old symbol of Christ. Now as a living equivalent of the Philosopher's Stone, Frodo is the rebus from the Latin resbis, meaning matter doubly or thing twice. Now, this is what the alchemists referred to as the androgyne or hermaphrodite, which was often pictured at the end of the work as a symbol of the perfect integration of male and female energies. Frodo achieves the rabis duality by embodying the so-called feminine characteristics of dependency and weakness, combined with traditionally masculine characteristics of determination and bravery. There's also the question of the duality implicit in the relationship between Frodo and Gollum. If we perceive Gollum as Frodo's shadow or his dark self, then there is a sense in which the two are melded into one hermaphroditic entity. Now, it's interesting that Frodo echoes this idea when at the close of the return of the king, he tells Sam that he was meant to be solid and whole and that he cannot always be torn in two. Frodo has himself been figuratively torn in two. Not only has the ring been torn from him, but his shadow self has perished in the same fire. The transformation is a recurring theme throughout the Lord of the Rings, as many of the characters must either confront or experience great changes in their lives, in the landscape around them, or within themselves. It's perhaps inevitable that characters like those in the Fellowship, who are instrumental in bringing about fundamental changes within Middle-earth itself, should experience alterations within their own sense of self. As Young states, nothing changes anything else without itself being changed. In Middle-earth, change is everywhere, so much so that Treebeard can sense that the world is changing, I feel it in the water, I feel it in the earth, and I smell it in the air. It's unavoidable. The story of the Lord of the Rings demonstrates that if something new is to be forged, what has come before must undergo transformation, or otherwise decay, be destroyed, or simply disappear. To effect the transformation of the base metal, and thus reflect the masculine and feminine polarity of existence, the two principal alchemical reagents of sulphur and mercury must come together. Alchemical sulphur represents the masculine, impulsive and red pole, whereas alchemical mercury or quicksilver is the feminine and cool complementary antagonist. The reagents are then combined within the alembic and the three stages of the alchemical work may commence. Now, at this point, I just want to interject, because if you go reading up on alchemy, you'll find that some will tell you that there's 14 stages and some will talk about seven stages um, and many will talk about four stages. But the vast majority of alchemical work since the 1500s will only refer to three stages. Uh, and that's what I primarily was working with, these three particular stages. Feel free to go away and have a look at some of the others because they're absolutely fascinating. Um, but in the three stage alchemy system that I've been looking at, the first stage is known as dissolution. It's usually called the negredo or the black stage in which the body of the impure metal, the matter for the stone or the old outmoded state of being is killed, putrefied and dissolved into the original substance of creation as Lindy Abraham says, in order that it may be renovated and reborn in a new form. Now, in the Lord of the Rings, this stage can be found quite clearly in the Fellowship of the Ring. Now, everything that once seemed safe and comfortable is taken away from Frodo, and his feet are set upon a path that will lead to the tearing down and renewal of both his own sense of self and the world that he knows. Johannes Valentinus Andre, in his 1616 publication of The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, describes how this stage of the alchemical work produces a black, blacker than black, for many diverse colours will appear. Those black clouds will descend to the body whence they came, and the junction of body, soul and spirit has been completed and turned to ashes. Now, a number of examples from the text illustrate both this deepest blackness and the breaking down of body, soul and spirit. And one of the most important of these is the Black Riders or the Nazgul, who frighten Frodo, Sam and Pippin during their walk to Crick Hollow and terrify Fatty Bolger, who had been left behind to keep up as long as possible 
the pretense that Mr Baggins was still living at Crick Hollow. When Tolkien describes the Nazgul, it's always in terms of both their own darkness and the darkness that surrounds them. On just one page in the text, they are black shadow, black figures like shades of night and dark shapes that move in the dark without moon or stars, That's just on one page. These are liminal creatures inhabiting a plane between the worlds of the living and the dead and whose body, soul and spirit have been utterly collapsed under their subjugation to Sauron and the Ring of Power. The second stage of alchemical transformation is the albedo, which is often represented by images of white coolness and water and follows the washing of the calcified matter in the bottom of the alembic. During this stage, much that once was is stripped away and metaphorically left naked. The contents of the Alembic are transparent and, again according to Andre, it is written that the black clouds are past and the great whiteness has been completed. Now understood in terms of literary alchemy, this is the stage where anything could happen, as the matter is not yet in a finished or complete state. So it's therefore unsurprising that images of white are prevalent in the two towers, which is also the second stage of the narrative. Eowyn, the white lady of Rohan, is introduced. Gandalf returns as Gandalf the White, almost certainly purified and strengthened by the Valar following his defeat of the Balrog. The White Rider, borne by Shadowfax, who shines like silver. The book begins with Boromir's final journey on water. Water in the form of Entrath purifies and heals Merry and Pippin after their ordeal with the Urukai. Now the albedo is part way through the transformative process. Puri purification of the matter has been achieved, but the work itself is not yet complete. Now the final stage is the Rubido or Red stage, which is also represented through images of fire and blood. Now, although it begins with the albedo, with the images of the white tree of Gondor and the white tower of Minas Tirith, this final rubido stage can be seen in the return of the king. The many battles cause the flow of much blood, a necessary sacrifice to the cause of freedom, including Frodo's maimed and bleeding hand. The songs of praise to Frodo and Sam on the fields of Cormallon have the red blood blushing in their faces. Gandalf is revealed in the final chapter to be the bearer of the elven ring Narya, the ring of fire with its red stone. In another symbol of the Rubido, the ring must be destroyed in the hottest of all fires, the chambers of fire in the heart of Orodrin, in which the last remaining shreds of the old Frodo are also burned away. The red work is the crucible scene, in which Frodo dies a figurative death and is saved both by love, in the shape of his loyal companion Sam, and faith, embodied by the actions of the remainder of the fellowship, and is rescued by Gandalf and the eagles, despite the despair engendered by the supposed revelations of the mouth of Sauron. A symbolic of the constant transformative process occurring both within the world of Middle-earth and in keeping with the purpose of literary alchemy within the reader themselves as they journey through the narrative, the different stages of the alchemical process are also evident within each individual book. So in The Fellowship of the Ring, for example, the Negredo stage is exemplified by the coming of the Nazgul, the fear of the Barrow Downs, the darkness of Moria, and the loss of Gandalf. But the Albedo stage can also be seen in the circle of white trees on Cairn Amroth, the road to Caras Galathon paved with white stone, the silver lamps and white stream of the gardens beneath the dwelling of Celeborn and Galadriel, who are themselves clad all in white, the water of the mirror of Galadriel, and the journey from Lothlorien down the great river Anduin. The Ring of Power, worn by Galadriel, Nenya, is known as both the Ring of Adamant and the Ring of Water. A Rubido stage is achieved when Boromir sacrifices himself for the sake of the hobbits, thus achieving purification of his soul after the taint of the ring. In the Two Towers, the Negredo stage can be found at the beginning, when the Fellowship is broken down into its different parts, each going their own way. The Albedo stage is in the return of Gandalf, now clad in white, the introduction of Eowyn, the White Lady of Rohan, the white-tipped mountains and white stream of Edoras, and the white symbol Munir flowers that mark the graves of the dead. The alchemical imagery of water that also marks the Albedo stage can be seen in the Ents' use of the river Eisen to wash away all the filth of Saruman. 
The Rubido stage is indicated by the light of the Tower of Kirithungal, which was glowing red and whose red eye watches the choices of Master Samwise as he faces a battle within himself to stay true both to the quest and to himself. In the return of the king, the Negrido stage is shown in the darkness of the plains of Gorgoroth, the dark threshold of the Samoth Nawa, where Frodo stands black against the glare and the final confrontation at the Black Gate. The gloom surrounding the city of Minas Tirith and its guards of the citadel, all robed in black, as well as the presence of the Nazgul upon their fell beasts, also signify the Negrido. The Albedo stage is indicated by the falling water, singing stream and broad river on the field of Cormallon, the healing of the White Lady of Rohan, the coronation of Aragorn with the ancient white crown, and the regeneration of the White Tree of Gondor. The Rubido comes when the hobbits return to the Shire, with the red leaves on the trees heralding the autumn. In the Shire itself, an unusual amount of burning going on, the horn cry of Buckland that twice warns of fire, and the large fire lit in the centre of Hobbiton where the first fight to remove Sharky's men takes place, all indicate this Rubido stage. The closing chapters of the Return of the King are also the end of the alchemical process that is ongoing throughout the entire narrative of the Lord of the Rings. After the Shire is rid of Sharky's influence, the Rubido stage is over. It is at this point that gold, the end product that indicates the successful culmination of the work of the alchemist, is to be found. At the end of their quest, Sam and Frodo are received on the field of Cormallon, the field of the Golden Ring, so named because it is surrounded by golden red Kulumalda trees, where the voice of the minstrel rose like silver and gold. The Malorn tree, which Sam plants in place of the party tree, burst into golden flowers in April, and most of the children born in the following year had a rich golden hair that had before been rare among hobbits. Sam's first child is named Eleanor for the little golden flower in the grass of Lothlorien. Frodo leaves Hobbiton for the last time on a fair golden morning, but it is significant that there are at this point a number of references to the colour white again. Frodo and Sam meet the company of elves, amongst whom is Galadriel, who sits upon a white palfrey and was robed all in white. On her finger was Nenya, that bore a single white stone. They ride through the white downs to the grey havens, where they meet Gandalf, a figure robed all in white, and Frodo embarks upon a white ship. As Frodo journeys over water and passes into the west, he sees the white shores of his destination before him. So why does Tolkien return to the albedo stage, significantly, significantly surrounding Frodo at this stage. Well, because unlike the narrative, Frodo has not yet achieved the final stage of the alchemical process. Wounded by knife, sting and tooth and a long term, Frodo must pass through the cleansing process of the albedo before he can reach the final transformative stage that will permit the transcendence of his soul. Frodo completes his role within the alchemical development of the narrative by dying to himself to effect the necessary transformative change, thus allowing himself to be broken down and reformed as the gold matter found at the end of the process. But Frodo's inability to heal within Middle Earth illustrates the absence of an idealizing resolution within the physical world. His own alchemical process can only be resolved by his retreat to Valinor, where his purification and final resolution can be achieved. So, Reading the Lord of the Rings through the language of alchemy offers a different understanding of the fundamental importance of transformation to this text. When in The Return of the King, Treebeard states that the world is changing, he's articulating one of Tolkien's most important messages, that nothing can stay the same. This applies to many of the central themes of the narrative, including the idea that one can never just go home. Many of the main characters undergo great changes while on their respective journeys. Whole species begin to leave Middle Earth, and even the landscape itself is altered when, with the destruction of the Ring, the towers, gates, and mountains of Mordor fall in ruins. Just as the alchemical process seeks to strip away from the original matter all that it once was, then, through purification and contact with the principal and the agents, we form the matter into the desired end product. So must Tolkien's characters submit to a process that remakes not only themselves, but also their homelands and their way of life. The Middle Earth that emerges from Tolkien's Alembic at the close of The Lord of the Rings is, therefore, 
a land reborn after a traumatic process of purification, through which a great evil is removed and a more traditional social order emerges. And that's all I have for you. Excellent, excellent. Thanks so much, Dr. Brown. That was it's that that kind of imagery is really fascinating. As you say, I think I think a lot of people under uh, both misunderstand. I was really glad that you um, explanation because I, th I do think a lot of people misunderstand exactly as you said, like thinking of it as merely quack science, right? Rather mm -hmm. than uh, thinking, especially for the for the, the the sort of symbolic significance it had, the 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 really kind of metaphysical process that they believed the thing to be, as well as yeah, yeah, it's highly spiritual, yeah, yeah, absolutely, um, and the way in which that's, I mean. You don't have to go back very far, not only among the authors that we read, but the authors that the authors that we read liked, right? Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. like you, throughout the, I mean, in the Renaissance, this was such a popular thing. People, people associate alchemy with the Middle Ages, right? But I mean, read, read just like any John Donne poem, right? Any John Donne poem, and you're absolutely uh, right. Like if you don't understand alchemy, you're going to miss like a quarter of the of the of the, of the pl wordplay, you know, that John Donne is up to, for instance. And and, and it's I mean it's it's very very pervasive that whole that whole vocabulary. And yeah, I think it's something that's, that's underestimated uh, by a lot of people. Well, that was really great. And I don't know, um, Sarah, if you could, I don't, can you see the uh, the 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 comments Question and box. questions as they come in? Mm. So if you, if you hit um, on the moderated chat window if you hit the moderator tools button it should pop up a window with the yeah i've got the uh, window the here okie dokie yeah. um so joe hoffman asks a new edition of the chemical wedding is coming out next month should i read it well i'll be reading it because i'm obviously um sorting out a lot of stuff because i've been invited to um as Prof. Olson might tell you at some point to do a whole course on tolkien in the summer semester um, and I'll be weaving in some of this because the course is about um, the way in which Tolkien is responding to the anxieties of mid 20th century. So I will certainly be reading it. If you have any interest at all in alchemy, then I would highly recommend reading it. Um, I mean, as, as, uh, as you just said, you read any of Dunn's poetry or in fact, a whole load of other uh, literature and you'll see yeah. alchemy as a real central point, but you don't have to go that far back. Read Harry Potter. Yes. And alchemy is throughout the seven books of Harry Potter. So, yeah, there's that one. Um, um, um. Kate Neville asks, do you know when Tolkien wrote these notes on Jung? Yeah, primarily in the 1920s and 30s, according to the enormous box of notes that I was going through at the time. Um, there was a lot of stuff from the 20s and 30s where he was looking at Jung. Um, as to whether he was looking at Jung post that time, I don't know because obviously there's only certain boxes of stuff that Christopher lets us have a look at. So I don't know what he's got that we don't get to see. Um, so certainly within the stuff I was able to go rootling through with little cries of joy every now and then, um, that's when most of the notes on Jung were being made. So uh, mid to late twenties into early thirties is what I got. Um, and then, uh, Marie Prosser says most early chemists were also alchemists or Sir Isaac Newton anyway absolutely oh yes definitely um, it's where chemistry started was in alchemy yeah and that's where that sort of fuzzy borderline between what we think of as alchemy is like the kind of Hubble bubble toil and trouble kind of thing let's turn lead into gold by magic kind of idea and that really incredibly serious spiritual journey that was from the early centuries of alchemy this is where that fuzzy borderline comes when it it transformed from there's another good word with alchemy it transformed from a purely spiritual journey into early chemistry and that's where we get this sort of um boundary between the two absolutely okay i think that's it more questions there yep very good. Excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, um, uh, Mary, uh, we have a, I have a, there's a, a separate chat box. 
it's complicated, uh, in which uh, a, a, a couple other listeners are participating. And uh, Mary Dole there uh, was just, she was pointing out how she's particularly struck by this idea of the sort of the parallel transformation, both of the characters and of and of the reader and how that, you know, think about the the way in which Tolkien talks about even, you know, I'm, I'm thinking here about the references that he makes even in the, like the, the prologue to the, the second edition of the Fellowship of the Ring, right? When he talks about the, the effect he would like to have on, you know, he, he would like mm. to, to, you know, to excite readers and maybe deeply move them at times and things. And, but, you know, there seems to be, um, when you think back to things like on fairy stories and his talk, even his talking about recovery and things, right? It's, mm. it's a small transformation, right? But it is very much a sort of a spiritual and mental transformation when he's talking about what fantasy can do, um, that it seems that there is that, you know, there does seem to be a real modeling of the kind of experience, you know, the way in which, or think of the, 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 the kind of um, effect that he says in on fairy stories that reading fairy stories can have on, on what is it callow lumpish youth right mm -hmm. uh and 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 the way that the way that that, that people are, are 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 brought to that kind of transformation i i, I agree I, I certainly think that thinking about it in these terms really does kind of help uh, uh acknowledging and recognizing uh that kind of that kind of impact and that certainly seems something that uh that that tolkien himself was was kind of thinking about yeah yeah Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. That was that was great. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. Excellent. Yes, I appreciate that. And yes, Dr. Brown is going to be teaching uh, a brand new course uh, for us this coming summer uh, in, in the summer, not the spring term, but in the summer term. Uh, uh, do you want to talk just a little bit about what that course is going to be? Sure. Yeah, no problem. Um, OK, so it's called uh, Middle Earth as a Roadmap to 20th Century Anxieties. Um, and in it, what I'm doing is I'm examining these Middle Earth texts as showing that kind of anxiety of the 20th century. So um, it's looking at all of those resonances within the text that reveal these difficulties. It's not looking at it as this equals this, you know, the, um, the, the Tom Shippey, I hate this, so you can't say this because... You know, obviously, we, we, we don't want to be going down the field of allegory, do we? It's not about that. It's about looking at all of those tensions that are going on. Um, so we're, we're looking at um, what's going on in Britain post First and Second World War, the way in which society is changing, um, the way in which those who lived through the early part of the 20th century and were used to a society being in a particular way now come out into the you know the 1940s and 50s looking at the world around them going what happened uh, what is going on here um and you've got a a new britain which is embracing technology which is is bringing in people from other countries with holy hannah different colored skins what are we going to do with this and what does that do for social cohesion and then there's women who are no longer necessarily comfortable with simply being the woman at home because they're, they're more used to having a role outside of the home. They've had to take over post First World War and Second World War, and they don't want to get put back into that box. Um, so what's going on there? How can we track these sorts of anxieties that are going on? Um, so there's, there's all sorts of um, strange things happening um, within Tolkien's own personal little world. And I'm looking at how those are shown within the text themselves. So that's what the course is all about. So it'll be 12 weeks of that. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Yeah, it's, I, I, I'm, I, I think it's really great to think about Tolkien in 20th century context. I mean, I'm one of those like medievalist Tolkien scholars who likes to think about Tolkien in a medieval context. Um, but I do, I think it's really great to be reminded of the really compelling sort of contemporary context, especially since, you know, I, I mean, thinking, of course, of Tolkien's own response to the idea of fantasy being merely escapist, right, as if it were merely kind of turning, turning a blind eye to the world around you and, and, and you know, uh, 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 instead kind of wrapping yourself up in this, uh, in this imaginary world as a kind of protective shell. Um, mm -hmm. But that's not exactly, it's, it's not divorced from the world around him. Tolkien's writing certainly was not 
um, and to think of it in that kind of isolation, um, as sometimes both, you know, his supporters and his detractors will both do, you know, in different mm -hmm. ways. Um, is, is, it doesn't really work. So anyway, I, I, I think that's, that's great. I'm really looking forward to that. So, mm -hmm. Well, when I, when I started my PhD, the, the big question that was in my head was, why are we still reading a book by some crusty old Oxford Don who's been dead <laughs> since the early 1970s? But seriously, why is this yeah. text still so important to us? Why does it still right. speak to us? Um, and Sarah Lagarde has just put in the question box, does it also look towards applicability to 21st century tensions? Well, yes, it does, because we have to think, why is it that here we are in 2016 and we're having talking courses? Why? Right. Yeah. So, yes, absolutely. It will be looking forward to um, all those things that Tolkien feared were coming. So we'll look at how it, it uh, is applicable to today as well. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Excellent. Okay. Very good. So uh, thank you very much for your time today, Sarah. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, we look forward, as always, to hearing more from you soon in our upcoming courses. Thank you very much. Thank you.